Hello, everyone. It is now 1 p.m. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Franco, and I'll be facilitating today's session on Ryerson Law. This is one of a series of events taking place this week as part of our fall virtual open house. We encourage you to check out our website and register for any other sessions that you might be interested in. Now to start, Ryerson has shifted to an essential services model to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. So we have put together a series of virtual sessions in order to share information and connect with you. So Ryerson is working diligently to provide students with fulsome learning experiences while still maintaining the health and safety of our community. Now, just in case this is the first time that you are using Zoom, just like to offer a couple of tips to, to get you started. We encourage you to ask questions throughout this session. So we have our team here on the back end to answer those. To do so, please hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom window where you'll find the Q&A icon. Click on that, a new window will open, and that is where you can submit your questions. Now, if you're also having some audio or video issues, maybe you can't hear me very well or see me very well, uh, please feel free to flag it in the Q&A as well, and one of our team members will be able to help you troubleshoot. You may also rearrange the screen however you see fit. Um, you can make the speaker view bigger or the presentation bigger, however you like. It won't affect the viewing experience of others. Now, we've also considered accessibility, um, so we have enabled closed captioning. Um, also note that recordings of all of our virtual open house sessions will be available on our website for viewing later in October. Now, to get us started, we do would like to get an idea of who's joining us here today. So if you can help us answer this poll, and let us know, are you in high school? Are you a current university student? Or you've already com completed your university degree? Gonna give it another five seconds or so. Okay. So let's share these results. A lot of you are still joint our current high school students. So it's always great to, to get started on your research early, I'd like to say. And then a couple of you are joining our current university students or have already graduated as well. Awesome. So to start, even though we're not currently physically on Ryerson's campus, it is important to acknowledge the land our campus stands on today. The land acknowledgement has become an important acknowledgement of Indigenous presence and assertion of sovereignty. It's stated at the openings of all of our events, meetings, and ceremonies. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations, peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Now, our university is committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and will continue to work and move forward on the path toward reconciliation. So to get us started on this session, I'd like to introduce you all to Andre from our Ryerson Law School. Over to you, Andre. Thank you so much, Franco. Really appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and for giving up your time. We really appreciate it. As Franco mentioned, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them into the Q&A window and a member of our team or I will get back to you as part of the presentation. So to begin with, I noticed that from the poll, uh, two thirds of this group uh, really are in high school at the moment. So I'd like to take you on a bit of a tour to first off, get a bit oriented around the idea of the career path in law and going to law school. And then we'll launch into a, a more detailed discussion about rise of law. Later on, uh, partway through the session, about the halfway mark, We'll also have the opportunity to meet uh, two of our current inaugural class members uh, to be able to share their stories with you and their journey. So let's get started. I believe that we need a new kind of law school that produces socially conscious lawyers that are looking to make radical change. We all have the right to have justice in our lives. It's our duty to break down those barriers and give as many people as possible access to justice.
I think one of the great things at the New Lawyers in Law School is putting a strong emphasis on entrepreneurship, which will not only teach the lawyers to think creatively in terms of their own practice, but also think about their prospective clients and how their clients will continue to evolve using technology, using you know, new ways of doing things. The very idea of the Ryerson Law School and what we want to achieve here has really forced the entire legal profession to think very carefully about what we want legal education to be. And we're already starting to see those changes all across the country. What Ryerson is doing is completely outside of the box. I think incorporating technology and providing an opportunity for students to actually not just become lawyers, but to, to garner skills to work in different industries, I think is phenomenal. Ryerson Law students will have access to a wider Ryerson Zone Learning Network, which is a type of ecosystem where you can meet the people you'll need to start your own business. I'm excited about Ryerson Law School because we're able to see what we would need for a lawyer in the future and today and be able to build that education from the ground up. I hope you enjoyed that tour to be able to learn a little bit about where Ryerson Law came from and the feedback that we received from the profession and helping to build this new and innovative law school. But you're probably all wondering, how do I get to law school in the first place? What's the path and what do I need to be thinking about? So, First off, for those of you who are still in high school, um, we want you to encourage you to do well, even in the current situation of whether you're remote learning or attending school in person, keep up what you're doing. Get involved in your community, get involved in your school, do all the things that will help you to be able to continue to build your skills and to be able to grow as you move forward. And then you begin your undergraduate degree, wherever that might be. Here at Ryerson, we have a lot of different opportunities that allow you to pursue a variety of career paths, including the path to law, but also there are a number of other places that you may want to consider as well. We encourage you as part of doing your homework like you are today with Ryerson Law to learn about our school, learn about everyone and figure out what makes the most sense for you and what will provide you with the opportunities to build your skills and learn and be passionate about what you're pursuing. One of the questions that I get from students quite often whenever I'm at a career fair or I'm at a university fair is around the fact that is there a particular undergraduate degree that I should take? Uh, to be able to pursue a legal career, to pursue the opportunity to go to law school. And to be quite honest with you, there isn't. Uh, we encourage you to follow your passions. So sure, if you have a strong interest in politics, in history, by all means, pursue that. But at the same time, if you have a strong interest in the fine arts, in music, in engineering, in theater, in uh, the sciences, we encourage you to follow those as well. What you want to do is make sure that throughout your undergraduate degree, you're continuing to build your skills and you're pursuing that passion to be able to develop a strong academic record and at the same time to be able to explore what you're interested in. There's plenty of time when you get to law school to continue to build on your legal skills, but we need you to build those other skills as well. So if you are taking an undergraduate program along the way that allows you to get involved with teamwork, communication skills, to be able to do research, to be able to write, that's wonderful and also to be able to explore other things that you have an interest in. So we encourage you to think broadly, follow your passions, and take them to where they will take you, and then on to law school after that. But what's the process then once you're in your undergraduate? We encourage you, while you're there, to start planning ahead. So if you're planning on writing the LSAT, make sure that you're doing the preparatory work that's necessary to do that standardized test. The LSAT refers to the law school admissions test. That's why it's called the LSAT, L-S-A-T. That standardized test is one of the elements that we and other law schools will look at when they are assessing your application. So you wanna make sure that you give it the due weight and preparation and the due time to be able to do the best that you can on it. So that may mean within your second year of undergraduate, considering what your next steps will be. Maybe you wanna start preparing a little bit on your own. Maybe you wanna investigate one of the free online courses, Khan Academy or others that are out there that can help you to be able to understand the test and to be able to be successful on the test. You may also choose to use a paid service or a tutor to help you along the way. Whatever you choose to do, make sure that you plan ahead and make sure that you schedule the test and schedule it in time as well. There are particular times throughout the year the test is offered and you wanna make sure that you understand that. So we encourage you to do your homework, schedule the test and be ready. So you do have your score, 
when you are making your law school application. And that brings me to the application phase. Every year, law school applications are due on November 1st here in Ontario. So if you're applying to one of the Ontario law schools, you need to make sure that you submit your application by November 1 of each year. That's the current date. So as you're thinking about that, you want to ensure that you've written the outside in time to have your score. You want to make sure that you've you know, got your transcripts together. You have started to get together all the other related material that each of the law schools will mention as part of their application process that you need to collect. So working on that will be helpful. The other part about this too though, is that all those extracurricular activities you're involved with, your work activities, volunteer experiences, gather that up, keep track of it. Make sure that you update your resume to ensure that you understand what you've been doing to build skills that will set you up for success in entering law school, but at the same time to get accepted, if you will. So we encourage you on that front. And then of course, once you are accepted, you begin uh, your journey over the three years with one of the law schools here, let's say in Ontario or across Canada or somewhere else. Um, we encourage you then to get involved and do your best to be a part of the community, to be engaged, and to do well in your academics also. Um, I'm going to take you then into, once you're in law school, what you need to be thinking about as well. So once you're in law school, and, and many of you are probably wondering, well, how do I now get through these three years and get a job in the legal field? Well, once you're in here, you've got three years that are happening, typically for the most part, at all Canadian law schools. As part of those three years, you're gonna have courses that will expose you to ways of thinking, to understanding the legal uh, landscape that's out there. But here at Ryerson Law, we're also gonna expose you to a number of other things to be able to allow you to develop a well-rounded skill set, to be uh, a solid contributor for the legal community, to service the clients that you're gonna be meeting, and to really be a 21st century practitioner. I'm gonna talk a bit, a, bit, a bit more about that as we get into the presentation. When you get to your third year of law school, you're gonna register for what's called the licensing exam. That's the exam that allows you to then uh, sit the bar or do the licensing exams that are required to eventually be called to the bar. Being called to the bar allows you to have your license and having that license then means you're a lawyer and you're qualified to practice law in Ontario. As part of that process, typically when you graduate from one of the Canadian law schools, except for Ryerson and Lakehead, you need to either complete the law practice program or you need to complete articling, which is basically a one year uh, journey after law school, working with a lawyer to develop the skills that maybe you weren't getting in law school or you need to further refine and develop. With Ryerson Law and one of the other law schools here in Ontario uh, up at Lakehead, you don't have to do that articling or that LPP component as part of graduating from law school. In fact, we build it into the curriculum and into the program. So you do a placement with an organization so you can fulfill that requirement. So all you need to do is write the exams, get called, and you're now a lawyer with your license to start practicing right away after graduation. That's one of the innovations required some law. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a moment. Once again, as questions come up, I know I covered that a bit quickly for you. Feel free to put them into the Q&A window and a member of our team or I will get back to you as part of the presentation. So let's dive in. What makes Ryerson Law unique? So when you think about Ryerson Law, I mentioned a moment ago about when you graduate from other schools, you have to do that articling piece or that LPP piece. In fact, when it comes to job opportunities in the marketplace at Ryerson Law and with a legal degree or a JD, in fact, you have the opportunity to work across a variety of areas. So you don't have to practice fully traditionally as some might expect. You have the opportunity to, yes, do private practice, but you can also be in-house counsel. You can work in government departments, legal clinics, and a variety of other JD Advantage type roles that are out there in the marketplace. So that includes policy and operations, strategy roles, regulatory affairs, management, compliance, risk and insurance, access to justice roles and technology roles, helping to make the legal system more accessible and more efficient, if you will, for our legal consumers that are out there. Ryerson Law has made a commitment as part of our uh, desire to embrace technology and innovation to ensure that we promote access to justice and that we ensure that we are modernizing the legal landscape. And as graduates of Ryerson Law, you can help contribute on that front with your skills to help ensure that our population can have the legal services they need across the board in a fair and efficient way. When you think about Ryerson Law, generally speaking, then, 
you're probably wondering, you know, we are new, the new kid on the block, if you will, when it comes to having a law school. But we're not, you know, so foreign or so separated from the legal community. In fact, we've had a long tradition of being involved in the legal community at Ryerson Law for many years through our law and business programs, our journalism programs, criminology, and other programs here on the campus. So we have faculty who teach in those areas who have also been cross-appointed to our school. We have a number of relationships with the industry uh, on these fronts as well. And we've leveraged that to help us in building and crafting an innovative school that's responsive to the needs of the marketplace, the needs of consumers, and the needs of employers. In addition to that, when you think about Ryerson Law and one of our pillars as well, is our equity, diversity, and inclusion. Ryerson itself has always been a tremendously diverse campus, located right here in the center of downtown Toronto. And that diversity across the board of disciplines and racialized communities, all are here studying together and working together. And Ryerson will embrace that as part of who we're recruiting to join us on the journey of building this innovative school and contributing to ensuring that our profession reflects the population that we're a part of, the province we're a part of, and the country in general that we're a part of. We want to make sure that the profession diversifies and is responsive to the community it's supposed to represent. In addition to that, though, too, we've had tremendous success in building and contributing to the community in very specific ways. The law practice program is a perfect example of that. Over the last number of years, in fact, over the last six years and now into year seven, the law practice program has worked with over 1,300 law school graduates from law schools across Canada and from around the world and helping them to develop their core skills to be able to bring legal education into the uh, 21st century and to be able to hit the ground running once they are called to the bar. So as part of uh, helping to bring that modernization, we've learned from that at what the LPP has done to be able to ensure that Ryerson Law can deliver uh, on that front too. Our legal innovation zone is a classic example of the first legal incubator uh, in North America. And as a legal incubator, what it means basically is that the legal innovation, innovation zone helps startups. So companies that involve um, lawyers, non-lawyers, like business folks, coders, marketing experts, and others to be able to develop new ways of delivering legal services in an efficient way and helping to ensure that we're providing access and opportunity. And our Liz has, at over the last number of years, in fact, five years plus, has incubated over 40 companies. So that's wonderful to see many of whom have gone on to be able to become large scale models servicing the legal community and consumers alike. We also have a number of strategic partnerships here on our campus and expertise. Whether you look at our long business program, once again, our criminology program, but also big data analytics, Watson's IBM Garage program, the Privacy Institute, the City Building Ryerson Program, and Roger Cybersecurity Catalyst. All of these programs have legal components to them, and we're partnering with them here at Ryerson Law to ensure that all of our students and our graduates have the opportunity to get that access, develop those skills, and bring them to bear once they're called to the bar. So at Ryerson, for us, being involved in the legal community has been a long history and a long tradition from the beginning. So, Opening up a law school is just in the next step, and we're looking forward to making that difference with 21st century graduates to change our profession and service consumers. Now, Ryerson Law, you're wondering, why do it now? You know, what's the reason for it? Well, throughout the legal profession, in fact, with consumers, uh, primarily, there's been a big cry around the fact that the legal profession as a whole has really not innovated. It hasn't changed very much. And in fact, lawyers still tend to work away the way they've been doing for the last 100 plus years. And what we wanted to do is ensure that our law school is preparing students to be able to graduate and act as lawyers in a 21st century capacity, bringing their entrepreneurship and their innovation to ensure that the legal services that are being delivered are being delivered in a positive and efficient way to expand access and opportunity. We also wanted to ensure that we embrace technology uh, when you think about a lawyer, many of you probably think about the robes, the gavel, the courtroom, and think about the traditional ways that lawyers have operated, and the many books that are on the shelves and the whole bit. Well, you know, legal education has also sort of stayed stagnant. It hasn't changed much. So we wanted to ensure that technology was brought in to help move all of that forward so that we are ensuring 
that the technology can help our students to learn faster and better, but at the same time, develop the skills to once again partner with consumers and those out there to ensure that legal services are becoming more equitable and accessible. When it comes to experiential learning, law school education hasn't changed in many, many, many years. In fact, when I went to law school many years ago and my predecessors, legal education today in most schools has remained pretty much the same. At Ryerson Law, that's not the case. In fact, we've ensured that our curriculum embraces partnering with practitioners in the field to ensure that we're delivering the legal uh, training, both theoretically and practically. So what happens within our courses is that each of our courses are co-taught and co-developed by leading faculty members, but also leading practitioners. So you learn the theory of contracts and you're also drafting those contracts. You also are learning the skills about how to interview a client while you're in criminal law, how to do a separation agreement and a, and a will within family law, how to deal with all the issues that come up that no one's really trained lawyers for once they get into practice, how to run your business as a perfect example. So we're trying to ensure that you come out with all the skills you're going to need to be successful in the marketplace. We also want, as I mentioned, are promoting access and opportunity to justice. And you can't really promote that if you're not really encouraging folks to leverage technology to create opportunity for those who need legal services delivered in a way that's accessible and that's also cost effective. You've heard probably uh, folks talk about the fact that they can't afford a lawyer or they can't find a lawyer to help them with this or they're just not sure where to turn to get something done that should be pretty simple. Our goal is to help ensure that through technology, through access, through hands-on training, that our graduates will be able to help deliver and bridge that gap moving forward. Ensuring access overall then includes diversity and inclusion. So when you look at our campus, as I mentioned a moment ago, and the diversity that we have here at Ryerson Law, I encourage you to look at our current cohort that has just entered Ryerson Law. They are truly diverse and representative of our city, our province, and our country. And by having lawyers look like the community they represent, folks are much more inclined to be able to partner with them. But at the same time, these lawyers are much more in tune with what's happening with our population and much more aware of the issues as we've all seen in the news recently, that are currently hurdles and obstacles in ensuring fairness and equity in our justice system. So we wanna make sure that we help to address those problems and serve them well. And of course, accessibility in all of its forms. That is our goal. So at Ryerson Law, we're truly taking on the challenges that are out there and ensuring that we bring legal education into the 21st century and that our graduates can contribute in a positive way. Our Dean highlights this as one of the reasons why she joined Ryerson Law and is leading our team. In fact, Dean Young has mentioned that she's so excited about our new approach to legal education. And this approach to legal education really is quite different than every other law school that's out there. And I wait here to say, not just in Canada, but globally as well. We've taken the best practices that we've seen that are out there in the profession and in other schools and in programs like the LPP and the Legal Innovation Zone and incorporated them directly into what we do and what we deliver for our students and for the legal community. So Dean Young, in championing the vision as we move forward, is helping to build our team, grow our school, and welcome all of you as we continue to move forward. If you'd like to learn more about Ryerson Law, I encourage you when you're visiting our website to download the short brochure that we have for you. It's at the bottom of the page in the footer. You can click it and you'll download a PDF. I've taken two little snapshots here to share with you about how Ryerson reimagines law school and telling you a bit about that diversity I mentioned a moment ago. The IPC, the Integrated Practice Curriculum, access to justice, technology at the core of what we're doing, as well as career readiness. And when you look at our curriculum, how it's divided up and what we focus on. And as I mentioned, that partnership of co-teaching with practitioners and faculty members to ensure you're getting the best of both worlds and to ensure you're developing all those core skills you're going to need when you're out there through our intensive programs. When you're starting the program at Ryerson Law and throughout, whether it's in technology, financial, coding, and emotional intelligence, learning how to deal with clients effectively, learning how to run your business. These are all things that have not been taught in law school before. And in fact, we felt that that was a major gap and so did employers. 
And what we've done is built it directly into our curriculum. You've heard me use the term IPC, Integrated Practice Curriculum. That truly makes Ryerson Law unique. We're only one of two schools in Canada that offers that. And that once again allows you to complete your legal education without having to article or do the LPP. You immediately get a chance to write good licensing exams and be called to the bar. We also have tremendous partnerships we've built with the community at large to create over 1,300 placements in the law practice program. And we're looking forward to leveraging those commitments and those placements as we move forward in building more for Ryerson Law for you to be able to fulfill your professional placement requirement. And to all of you in building your networks and bringing opportunities in. Past employers with us and partners have included in-house legal departments at major banks and corporations, public sector institutions, large, small, and mid-sized organizations, specialty boutique firms, government departments, legal clinics, and small and sole practitioners. The entire gamut of the legal spectrum, if you will. And we're excited to be able to partner with more groups as we move forward. When it comes to admissions, 150 students each year, that's our goal in admitting our, our cohort. It's a bit smaller than many of the other schools and purposely so to help ensure that we can deliver legal education in a way that's hands-on and allows you to get all the skills that you need. It also gives you the chance to get to know your colleagues a little bit better, know your faculty a bit better, and be able to build the network and support that you will need to be successful in the legal community. When it comes to your GPA, we look at your top 20 classes as part of your undergraduate and calculating that uh, in helping to uh, review your application. We also though look at a number of non-academic requirements. Of course, we look at your LSAT score as I mentioned a moment ago, but it forms a smaller portion of the weighting, but we do consider it. We look at your personal statement very carefully to understand why you believe Ryerson Law will be the right place for you. So make sure that when you're crafting that, you help us appreciate what it is that's attracted you to Ryerson Law and what you hope to be able to contribute and to add to the legal community as you move forward. We also at the same time as part of our admissions process, we are the only law school in Canada who has an online interview. That online interview allows us to get to know you better. And in, by getting to know you better and having you share your story with us through the online interview process, we can then make a much more holistic decision when it comes to admissions. And that's our goal. We look at all of our applicants. And in fact, this past year when we were going through our process, we received the same number of applicants as all the major law schools. And we went through all of the applications to be able to make up the cohort that we have today and we'll continue to do that moving forward. Yes, it is labor intensive. Yes, it requires a lot of resources, but we believe in order to ensure that we fulfill the vision of our action law, we need to dedicate those resources and be able to pursue this vision uh, by ensuring we have a holistic admissions process. The deadline, remember, November 1st of every year. That's the deadline at the present. For those of you in high school, make sure you always check to see if that deadline changes, but it's been this way for the last number of years. Um, so make sure that you've written the LSAT and you've got your score ready to submit. If you haven't written it by the November 1st deadline, the last LSAT that we will take is the January LSAT score. But remember, if your LSAT score has to be delayed until January, we won't be able to look at your application until we get that score in. So if you can get it all done early and by the deadline, that's wonderful. That means we can look at your entire application. Now, enough of me, really. Let's hear from the folks who joined us. And before I do that, I just want to play a short clip for you. Inclusion. Equality. Protect. Access. Shadow. Fight. Justice. 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 To fight for greater access to justice for all. To shatter the norms and rebuild the law. To give a voice to those who are unheard. To make everyone truly equal under the law. Why? 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 Why will you apply? Wonderful. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our incoming or our current class, in fact, our inaugural class, Rene Gill, who you saw just a moment ago in the video, and Anthony Brum. Welcome. Thank you both so much for taking the time this afternoon uh, to share your experience with us and with our, our viewers who are investigating Ryerson Law and Ryerson University. So I'll begin with a question to both of you, and I'll start with you, Renee. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us, you know, what, 
was your past education? And what brought you along this way to be able to choose to decide to pursue a career in law? Fire away. Thanks, Andre. So before I start, I just want to thank Andre and the rest of the team at Ryerson for having Anthony and myself here today. Super excited to be here. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Ryerson Law, so I'm uh, very happy to be here and, and helping these students in any way that I can. Um, so a little bit about me and my background and how I kind of chose to go to, to, go to law school. There's really two main reasons. Um, so the first is it, it really just started with a genuine interest in law. And I think around the age of 13 or 14 is when I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, at that age, I really didn't know what that meant or what that looks like, but it just started with that interest that developed over time um, through me taking my first set of law courses in high school, which also developed further when I decided to major in law and business at Ryerson for my undergrad. So it started with that interest. And um, the second reason was because I always knew that I, I really wanted to do something meaningful with my career and whatever chosen profession I would do. And I genuinely felt that I could do that uh, with being a lawyer and with going to law school to achieve that goal. So um, the fact that I enjoyed studying the law and that I, I really liked that, I figured that becoming a lawyer was the right path for me. And so that's why I decided that going to law school was the way to achieve uh, those two things together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee. Anthony, thank you so much as well for joining us. Tell us your story. Hi, everyone. Um, so the way I took my path to get here, uh, I was not as certain at a young age. I kind of decided within the second last year of my undergraduate degree, I knew that I was going to either do a master's or law school. Um, and I know where my general end goal was, which was in foreign policy and defense. Um, and I, I, it took me a while and I had to talk to a lot of professors and I had to converse with a lot of other people that were involved in the legal community, but also people that were academics and outside of academics to kind of garner what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew that I wanted to end up in government. So um, in my undergrad, I did an international studies degree at Glendon Campus York University uh, with a bilingual degree in French. Um, and kind of from talking to professors there that were professors, but also lawyers, I realized that I can do research and I can also get a profession at the end of the day um, by going to law school and then do research with like a master's later on in life, which I thought was really important to me of kind of guaranteeing that there's some sort of career at the end, that you have these skills and this practical experience to really get to that point. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, so that both, so our audience understands this, Rita, you did your undergraduate at Ryerson, Anthony, you did yours at York. So you don't have to do your undergraduate in law school in the same location. So if everyone uh, is, is wondering about that, um, when we look at applications for Ryerson Law, along with all of the other schools, the other law schools, uh, we look at all the applications that we receive and we don't provide any preferential treatment uh, for folks who went to our undergraduate. You're all in competition together for the opportunities that are being offered. So you can do your undergraduate at Ryerson and there are lots of opportunities here. You can do it somewhere else as well. You still are eligible to apply to write some law. Um, Rene, I'm gonna lead off with you here for a second. Now, you, you touched on this briefly during your introductory answer about why you decided to go to law school. Um, but considering that two thirds of our folks are in high school here who are watching right now, um, were there other elements that helped to influence that decision, that helped shape you other than maybe some of the courses that you were doing, were there things that you were involved with extracurricular wise or volunteer wise that really helped you appreciate that this could be a career of advocacy that where you can make a difference or or something else that triggered that for you yeah so in high school um there wasn't really any extracurricular law related things that i that i did that led to that but in my university undergrad experience completely different story um, I, I was a part of a student group. I got involved with the Law and Business Student Association. I was there for three years. So that's three years out of my four years at undergrad. That was an amazing experience. And to be honest, um, everything that I've achieved up until now, when I look at how I got to Ryerson Law, I can trace it all back to the moment that I joined the Law and Business Student Association. So um, joining that team was, was really amazing. It, it opened up a lot of doors for me. It really helped to provide me with different resources and help me to understand and explore more of what I could do with the law and, and being a lawyer and, and all that fun stuff. Um, it also really helped with networking and building my network. Um, working with that student group is what introduced me to 
uh, what would then become my job at the Legal Innovation Zone at Ryerson University. So it was through that student group that I was introduced to my future boss and I ended up working at the Legal Innovation Zone for uh, about two years. Um, so that was a really incredible experience. And it was really, I would say, during my work experience and my student group experience where I was able to explore and understand and really solidify exactly what I wanted to do with my law degree and what being a lawyer would mean for me. So I hope yeah. that answers your question. Thank you so much, Renee. I, and I've got to say, Renee, uh, you, you, you summed up your involvement with the Law and Business Student Association very quickly and succinctly there. But I, I've got to commend you on the amount of work you've done. I have worked with you on some of those events where you've asked me to partner and uh, it's a tremendous amount of energy and effort you put in but it was all well worth it in the long run because you were able to make the network in the context that you did at the same time build your skills and be exposed to all potential opportunities that are coming your way. Anthony um, tell us a bit about that motivation as well you touched on that a little bit when it comes to the master's program and it comes to uh, what you were debating about when it comes to getting those practical skills to have a career but stepping back again, these folks are in high school still, two thirds of them. Some are in their undergrad. You know, help, help us understand some of the things that they can do as part of that experience to help on that front. Um, so I think I can uh, kind of help. I took law, I took a law class in high school um, that I thought was really interesting. And I think usually for Ontario curriculum, they provide it within either your grade 11 or your grade 12 year. Um, there might be an option to do a law class or kind of a legal studies class. It'll be very vague. It won't touch as many uh, subjects, but you'll do debating and stuff like that. And I found that class extremely interesting. Um, it's the reason why in high school I switched from like all the sciences to my more like social studies, history, world history, law school um, kind of focus and then focusing more on academics and like academic writing. Um, the one thing that I do think really propelled me to this direction was that um, I do realize that like sometimes your job may not be like where you get purpose, but I definitely think that my volunteering outside of school as well as volunteering while I was in high school really changed the way I thought about it, as well as the experiences of my parents um, kind of informed the way I wanted to go. So I think in high school, um, I came out and so that was really tough. And so I wanted to like, you know, really create a legacy for myself um, that was away from my parents in high school. And I understand that like high school is so, there's so many things going on and you're trying to make so many decisions and it's really tough. Um, and so I really think at those points in time for me, I like made the decision that I wanted to do something that I'd be proud of um, and have more of an impact and be able to provide like one of the pillars to Ryerson Law is like access to justice. And I think it was really important for me to see that when I was applying, but I've carried that with me nonetheless since I was in high school about like equity as well as like not beyond just diversity, but like, you know, more about acceptance rather than tolerance and those things came from high school experiences that I think you can get. And I think it's really important to find those opportunities, be it your community center or be it at school as well. Um, that informed my decision. Wonderful, thank you, Anthony. And I'm gonna continue on with you for a second there. Um, you started to touch on why, you know, Ryerson Law, that ability to make a difference and have access and open up the doors for equity and full inclusion, if you will. So tell us a bit more about why you chose Ryerson Law in particular as part of your application process and your decision making? I chose Ryerson because um, I thought the practicality was really important to me. Practicum is very important. Before applying to Ryerson recently, I was working for two years and I knew for certain that I didn't want to do a degree that I thought would be like my BA. Sometimes in your BA, you can get really lost. You can kind of do something for four years or five years and then not really have a trajectory for a job or a career. And to me, um, like it was very important that I'd be able to be financially stable afterwards. So Ryerson really gave me that onset of like that security of like having a job afterwards, always being committed to that factor. The second reason was I have a lot of friends that have gone to Ryerson and now they're like at Amazon or Facebook or Google and they're in California or they're in New York. Um, and some of the panelists from the intensive that we had this for the first week of law school 
uh, were really interesting in Ryerson graduates. And I, the third point that really quickly I wanted to make was that it's a three-year program and not a four-year commitment. And to me, that's a huge, a huge plus um, because you know, being able to get your degree in three years is a very American style of doing law school. Um, Canadians have articling and in America, you know, like in the US, you don't have that requirement. And I think that it, it makes sense. You're also able to get into the workforce much sooner. You're able to put your, get your feet wet sooner. Um, and then if you want to continue with the education, you also have that like you have that ability to start like, you know, pursuing more if you wanted to, right? So there's a lot of options with three years instead of four. And I value that time a lot more than, um, whereas other programs offer only four years, like three years and then articling, which is a requirement. So that was a big deal for me. It was a very big deal. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anthony. Over to you, Renee. Do tell. I know, I know you were sort of born and bred here at Ryerson, but you had options too. Why Ryerson Law? Yeah, so I love this question because for me, actually, you know, in my undergrad, even though I, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, I was very back and forth still with the idea of law school and, and making the decision to apply there. So I felt very indecisive over it still. Um, but when, when it was announced that Ryerson Law was coming out and the way that I saw the program being built on the curriculum and the different pillars and the way it was being done, it was a no brainer for me. Like I just, I knew right away that Ryerson Law was the only law school that I wanted to go to. I only applied to two law schools and Myers Law was one of them. Um, and it was the only law school that I was going to go to. Like that was it, that was just a no brainer for me. And I think there's quite a few reasons for that. And I think very similar to Anthony, um, one of them was because, you know, through my work experience with the Legal Innovation Zone, I, I really gained a, an appreciation for legal tech and for legal innovation and for access to justice. And um, just like Anthony, Anthony said, you know, Ryerson Law has pillars that are based on these very things. And so it was like, oh my goodness, this law school is perfect for me. It's, it's completely screaming at me. It's everything that I'm interested in, everything that I value. Um, and also it was just very different than everything else I was looking at. You know, I think that indecisiveness that I had um, to actually apply to law school said a lot about the things that I was thinking about and things I was concerned about with going to law school. And Ryerson Law just kind of shut off all those concerns for me. Um, the practicality of the program, 100% agree with Anthony that that was a huge selling point for me. I'm someone who learns by doing, and so I really appreciated that being so integrated into the curriculum. Just this morning, I had a tutorial for contracts, and we were reviewing a contract. We were actually going through a, a non-disclosure agreement, and we were reviewing it, and we were talking about it, and it was just—it was so amazing. It's such an incredible way of learning. So um, I think those are my 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 main reasons why I chose to go to Ryerson Law. Wonderful, wonderful. And you just touched on one of the questions that I saw coming in. And I know the questions are coming in. Um, I'm going to be getting to some in a moment, but I've got a few more of my own. If you've got questions, though, fire them in. Our team will answer them. And we will also try to answer some of them live here as well. Um, when it comes to the classes on the courses, you were just touching on your, your contracts class. Um, tell us a bit about this new experience, because here you are getting the opportunity to have faculty members and practitioners working with you as part of this. And I guess I do know it's only been, I guess, three weeks in so far. Um, and I, 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 you know, tell us your impressions uh, about it at this stage. Uh, sure, so I can, I can take the, the first go at that. So uh, with Ryerson Law, there's a, there's a co-teaching model, right? So we, we first learned the theory with, it, with an academic professor and then we kind of were, uh, we're sent off into our tutorials with, with a practitioner and there's more of a practical approach to learning about it. And I, I personally, I love this approach so much. I find it just so fascinating. It's so exciting. It's so much fun. And for me, like I said, I learn best by doing. And so I struggle a bit when I'm studying theory, but once I apply it to an actual scenario, I'm actually, you know, I just studied a theory of contract, but now I'm reviewing a contract and I'm seeing how that theory applies. I find that really resonates in my brain and I really, really appreciate that. And on our first, uh, our first tutorial with our practitioner for contracts, for example, our instructor said to us, you know, I'm going to be, we're not talking about the elements of the contract. We're not talking about theory of a contract here and the practical aspect. Um, I'm going to treat you like you're an articling student or like you are a brand new associate at a law firm. Like that's how you're going to be treated in this tutorial. And so I, I really appreciate that. I think it's just such an incredible way to learn. It's so different. And um, I just think it's such a great way of really building uh, the future lawyers like like Ryerson Law is promising and really getting us to hit the ground running once we graduate. So 
Um, it's been a really amazing experience so far, and I'm looking forward to the next few years of doing this. Wonderful, Renee. Thank you. And, and just by way of context, before I uh, turn it over to you, Anthony, um, when I graduated from law school um, many years ago, um, I learned the theory of contracts. I took the business associations course, I took the securities course. I took a lot of the business courses that were available within my law school. And I was selected for a great opportunity on Wall Street where I, was, where I summered and I practiced law uh, for a number of years. But when I graduated and started on my first day there in New York, um, like you said, I didn't know how to take the theory and put it into the contract and to understand even how to draft that contract. I had to learn all of that on the job, starting on my first day, working on you know some hundred million dollar deal contracts. You know, it was it was quite interesting from the perspective that I thought, what did I get from those three years? And here at Ryerson Law, as you just described, in your first three weeks, we're already giving you the opportunity to draft the contract, understand it. So that when you are out there, as you said, you can hit the ground running to appreciate what you really are doing. Anthony, your perspective so far, three weeks in. It's been really great. Um, talking about drafting contracts, I have a, a contract due uh, next Monday. <laughs> I have a user's clause uh, due next Monday. So if you're going to be, if you want to do the practical, you're, you're definitely going to be launched into it. Um, the one thing I do want to mention about like the courses and the teachers, I've really appreciated working alongside uh, lawyers who are in the tutorials with us. I really do appreciate that style of learning. It really makes a huge difference to see people that are still in the field and working. Um, that's always a very important question to ask when you're considering not even law schools, but also undergraduates. Uh, undergraduate programs, are people still in the field? Are they still active and doing what they are supposed to be doing? Are they publishing frequently? Are these lawyers going to court? Are they not going to court? What are they doing to stay active within the field? Um, it really does change the perspective of your education. And it really does tell you about what's the focus of the school, what's the focus of the university. Um, and I think that'd be very important to let you folks know that now. Um, and to give you folks the edge of like having that up your, on, your, on, on yourself at this point in time. But the other thing I'd like to mention as well is that, you know, a lot of the students are first generation students. And to me, that was very important. And so uh, I think those were the two prongs that really got me very excited about the classes and the, and the colleagues we have in the classes as well. Wonderful. Thank you for mentioning that too, Anthony. Um, you are correct that over three quarters of our incoming class here that are with us right now are first generation attendees for law school. So when we say first generation, what we mean is no one in their family or immediate family attended law school before. So this is the, their family's foray into, into legal education. Uh, and that's a commitment on our part here at Ryerson to ensure that we create access and opportunity. Uh, it's always uh, here to ensure that we support those folks too as well once you are here. And that's critical and that's why we had the Ryerson Law Intensive to help prepare everyone to launch into their classes when they begin. And that intensive was centered around helping you to uh, appreciate the legal landscape, develop the skills that you're going to need to be able to be working in your classes with those practitioners and your faculty members. So we are setting you up for success along your three-year journey. You also mentioned something else, Anthony, about the undergraduate and choosing where to go. We are very fortunate here at Ryerson that we remain current because we have an undergraduate program that has a lot of folks who are working within their fields, teaching as well here at Ryerson across the board. In addition to that, many of our undergraduate programs have co-op as an element as part of it, which allows you to further build your skills and build your expertise in your resume and your network as you move forward. And much like both of you in your classes now, you're expanding your legal network by getting a chance to meet and learn with your practitioners who are part of your tutorials and your classes. So that's critical as part of all of this, we believe in creating a vibrant community that's gonna be successful moving forward. Now, before I get to uh, one of my other questions, I noticed a couple of the questions coming in and one of them was around the fact that, what if I didn't take poli-sci 
or I didn't take history, or I chose to do economics or science or chemistry or engineering, should I still consider law school? Can I do it? And I think one of the immediate answers that I can say absolutely is yes. Do what you're passionate in, but at the same time, if you feel that you haven't had a chance to work on your writing skills, your analytical skills in, your, in those programs, use your volunteer and extracurricular opportunities to do that, to build on those skills that you're gonna be leveraging here within law school. So we welcome a variety of disciplines, and in fact, we're one of the most diverse uh, programs when it comes to where people have been admitted from across the undergraduate sphere. So for sure, it, it is possible and encouraged because we want to create that access and that collaboration between uh, non-lawyer areas, whether it's nursing, whether it's science, whether it's engineering, fine arts, or somewhere else, we want to bring those skill sets together to come up with new types of solutions to service the marketplace. Um, another question that um, I, I want to get to before we uh, get into the wrap-up phase is your experiences now with a founding school. It's a brand new school. You are the first cohort. And Anthony, I'll get you to lead off first on that because I know that some people are thinking about this. They've got other schools here in the city who've been around a bit longer or maybe a lot longer and are still doing things sometimes maybe the same way for many, many years. Um, you're part of a new school. What does that mean for you? And what does it mean uh, for your involvement here? Uh, do we have things in place or are you part of the set of folks who are helping to build those things as you come in? Anthony, first over to you. So uh, with a founding school, I think there's a lot of opportunity to take on reins and take on op like roles that you would traditionally would never take on. So um, for an example, I'm like the, the elections officer, the chief returning officer for most of the clubs on campus so far. And myself and another student, Samir, have been officiating kind of a documentation for clubs to send off to chapters that are going to be going to like Balsac, which is like the Black Law Students Association of Canada to affirm their elections or their appointments have been done properly. So I would have never had that opportunity if I had gone to a school that has all these organizations already together. Um, founder roles that are really important in extracurriculars. You know, you just see like the old names from like the 80s and 60s all the time that are like from other schools that like there's these people that like had these like names, they wrote the documents. And I think by going to a founding school, you really get the opportunity to, to mold it in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, I understand the risk and the nervousness, like, cause everybody has that. But I, I think that, you know, when I talk, my partner's also in law school. Um, and when I talk to him about it, you know, there's a lot of more restrictions when you go to a school that's already been well established and has very strict traditions. Um, you don't have those opportunities or those leeways is to really put your voice into it. Um, and you'll definitely see this within your undergraduate. You'll definitely see the limits that come in um, wherever you go um, that like, you know, you won't be able to do certain things in your first year. Whereas in a founding school, you have the opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty of getting uh, involved as well as like the education. Wonderful, thank you, Anthony. Riddey, over to you, same question. Yeah, kind of just adding to what Anthony said, I think when Andre, when you asked that question, also in my mind, the first thing that popped into my head was opportunity, right? There's just an infinite, infinite amount of opportunity for us to shape the school for us to build student clubs and opportunities for future cohorts, for us to build community to, to establish what Ryerson Law means, what being a Ryerson Law student means. And I think, uh, so I don't repeat what Anthony said, I think um, two other points I want to bring up about going through this experience is it's been really incredible to see just how much all of us being a part of this inaugural cohort, being a part of this founding school has brought us closer together. So I think five, four or five months ago, you know, we already had groups established on on Facebook or whatnot, and we were already getting to know each other and already talking about all these things that we had envisioned for Ryerson Law and what we were hoping to do, not just for us either, but for future cohorts. Like when I see people who are um, envisioning things they wanna build in the school, it's, it's more so thinking about for future cohorts to come. And I, I find that so incredible. I think that's very telling to the kind of people that we have in our cohort and just how much we care about that 
building of community and just really establishing Ryerson Law as something amazing. And the other point that I really want to mention is, you know, um, when it comes to thinking about why there's a brand new law school, you know, it's, it's not that we ever needed another law school per se. It's that we needed something different. We needed some sort of change in legal education. And Ryerson Law really is serving that purpose. It's really uh, filling in those gaps like Andre was talking about earlier. And I think all of us can agree that we're, we're really seeing that in Ryerson Law. And even that's why we all chose to take the risk on this brand new school. And um, you're, we're only a few weeks into the program, but I think we're all very happy and we have no regrets. And it's been a really incredible experience so far. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you so much, Anthony, as well. Before I give the final question, as a quick reminder to everyone, I know I can't get to every question that's coming in, uh, but if you have supplemental questions after this webinar, uh, we encourage you to email them to law admissions at ryerson.ca, law admissions at ryerson.ca, and a member of our team will be happy to get back to you. So whether that's about tuition, or it's about GPAs, or it's about other types of questions that you might have, feel free to email those questions in and someone will respond to that question. So my final question then for you before we wrap up then is your parting words or tips for folks as they're getting ready to apply or as some of our folks are starting their undergraduate education. First, over to you, Renee. So there's a few things I would say. I think first I would say, especially if you're just kind of getting into university or you're, you're in that phase right now, get involved. Like whether that's through extracurriculars at school, whether that's volunteer experience, work experience, whatever it may be, I really, really encourage students to get involved during their undergrad. For sure, uh, do your best to get good grades um, and to maintain good marks. But I, I find that personally my best experiences and my best learnings came from my actual physical experiences with my student group and with my work experience um, and with volunteer experience. So I strongly encourage students to get involved in, in any way that um, will help them and in any way that interests them. And the second thing I would say, um, more so for when you're applying to law school is, you know, there, there are a lot of different elements that come into play with your application. There's, lot, there's lots of different things that you have to think about and you have to navigate through these things. And it can be even harder to navigate through these things if you don't have anyone in your circle and your family or friends who have gone through the process or, or who can help guide you. So um, I would say, you know, obviously, of course, do your research and do the best you can to uh, kind of figure out how to navigate those things. But also, don't be afraid to use it as an opportunity to reach out to people that you don't know, uh, people who have gone through that process to uh, connect with them. So it's a chance to build your network as well and also to get their guidance. I think no one, people will always be happy to chat with you about that. Over the past month, I've had so many coffee chats with students who are thinking of applying or who are currently applying and they just kind of want to hear the lay of the land and what my experience was like. And so I, I really strongly suggest that you don't be afraid to reach out to people. And uh, my final point would be that, again, during the application process, it can get very daunting at times. For me personally, I felt very uh, quickly consumed with stress and with self-doubt. And I, I found it very difficult at times during my application process. But what really kept me going was remembering why I was applying to law school, why I wanted to go to virus and law and how badly I wanted to go. And I really just let that passion fuel me throughout the process. So I would say, don't let yourself get consumed by that. Support your, uh, surround yourself with great support from friends and family and just remember why you're doing it and how much you wanna do it and allow that to fuel you throughout the process. Wonderful, thank you so much for a Wonderful words of wisdom and advice. And for those of you who aren't aware, Renee has a blog out there as well. Uh, so do a quick Google and you will find Renee's blog, which has some great tips and great information too. Anthony, over to you. Um, so as you folks are mostly high school students, I'd like to let you know, I was going to say this about JD or your LSAT, but I'm going to say the journey is a long one and you're just beginning this journey. Don't get dissuaded along the way and don't get hesitant just because you've reached roadblocks. You have many years in front of you to take opportunities to reflect, to learn, and to pause and really take in your environment. There's gonna be a lot of decisions, but take it one step at a time. Don't be afraid to get in contact with your schools or their recruitments using the OOF website. You can easily get in contact with your Ontario universities that way and get in contact with Ryerson to learn more. And I saw a question earlier on about um, international student. Uh, and I would say, start your application as soon as you can. If you wanna start it early, especially for your undergrads, you're gonna be writing personal statements all the time, getting used to that story and really making it your own and contextualizing it to each uh, school. This advice applies well with 
law school as well. You have to take into consideration who's your audience um, and who are you writing to. And don't forget to keep it personal, you know? You want to make sure that you're not repeating the same things that you're mentioning to other schools as you need to reframe it to other schools having different pillars of education and different pillars of focus. Um, the one thing is I'm going to add to it. They don't mention this to you in school. They don't tell you about this in undergraduate. You learn about this when you volunteer extracurriculars outside and volunteering. Don't, don't commit to volunteer fatigue. Really make sure that you keep in mind your volunteer fatigue because it's a huge issue. Uh, schools, I feel, don't talk about enough about it, but you want to make sure that you get involved, but don't overextend yourself because it's very easy to do so. Um, and many people burn out within their second or third year and you want to make sure that you kind of keep that on a lid, but you got this. Uh, it's just the beginning of the start of this journey. Don't let your undergrad or your LSAT dissuade you from continuing. It's a long process. It's just one step at a time. Thank you so much, Anthony. Great words of advice. Absolutely. Uh, choose things carefully. Get involved where you can. Follow your passions and surround yourself with supporters who are gonna cheer you on as you go. Um, I thank you both tremendously for giving of your time. I know how busy your schedules are. I know how busy all of you as well, studying at home or doing whatever it is you're doing when it comes to uh, your time right now. So we thank you for joining us. We encourage you, if you have more questions, visit us at ryerson.ca slash law. Email your questions to lawadmissions at ryerson.ca. We'll be happy to respond to you help join us to set a new precedent here at Ryerson Law. We're already doing it with our folks. And Franco, back over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre, and to our current students, Rene and Anthony, for joining us today. We're going to be shutting down our audio and video now, but we're still going to be, still going to be online for a few more minutes to get to any uh, last minute questions that you have. So please feel free to continue sending those. A reminder that the recordings of our virtual open house sessions will be available on our website later in October. However, this won't include a copy of the Q&A. So if you did receive an answer to your question, I encourage you to either take a screenshot or note down the response that you got. We're going to be hosting another virtual open house, actually. So this is actually part one of two of our fall virtual open house series. So the next one will be happening on November 9th. Uh, which will feature a lot more program specific information sessions for each of our undergraduate programs. And I hope we can see you there as well. So on behalf of Ryerson, uh, all of our presenters today, and everyone here um, on the back end, thank you once again for joining us today. And I hope we see you in other sessions later this week. Bye now. Bye-bye.